Genesis chapter 21. The Lord came to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the appointed time, God had told him. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one Sarah bore to him, Isaac. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made me laugh. And everyone who hears me, hears, will laugh with me. She also said, Who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son mocking, the one Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, Drive out this slave with her son, for the son of this slave will not be a co-heir with my son, Isaac. This was a very difficult thing for Abraham because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be concerned about the boy and your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her, because your offspring will be traced through Isaac. But I will also make a nation of the slave's son because he is your offspring. Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a water skin, put them on Hagar's shoulders and sent her and the boy away. She left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. So so as she sat nearby, she wept loudly. God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. Get up, help the boy up and sustain him, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew. He settled in the wilderness and became an archer. He settled in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, Abimelech, with Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here by God that you will not break an agreement with me or with my children and descendants. As I've kept faith with you, so you'll keep faith with me and with the country where you are a resident alien. And Abraham said, I swear it. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the water well that Abimelech's servants had seized. Abimelech replied, I don't know who did this thing. You didn't report anything to me, so I hadn't heard about it until today. Then Abraham took sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. But Abraham had set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock. And Abimelech said to Abraham, Why have you set apart these seven ewe lambs? He replied, You want to accept seven ewe lambs from my hand, so that this act will serve as my witness that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because it was there that the two of them swore an oath. After they had made a covenant of Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, left and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he worshipped the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham lived as a foreigner in the land of the Philistines for many days. This is the word of the Lord. Laughter is a wonderful sound. I don't know if you've ever listened to one of those pure belly laughs. Uh, The laughter of joy. It's one of the best sounds you can hear. Uh, It communicates delight. Uh, It's a raw emotion. Uh, Often it reveals a deep-seated satisfaction with life at that moment. When was the last time you laughed like that? When was the last time you heard that kind of laughter? I'm going to hazard a guess here, and it's not just the show that's made us tired this morning, but I suspect that many of us are so worn down in life that we struggle to laugh that way. I suspect that even as the people of God, life in a broken world 
has stolen the delight and joy of laughter from us. The promises of God seem wonderful but amazingly distant. The damage of sin surrounds us everywhere we look and often that reduces our life to a certain shade of grey. A struggle to get by, moving from one emotional crisis to another just to feel alive. Such an experience of life removes the tinge of delight that comes from God's grace. I suspect that at the start of Genesis 21, at the end of Genesis 20, Abraham was in a very similar place. And then one day, there was laughter in the camp. And we're going to look at that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I really, those opening couple of verses in Genesis 21 are so matter of fact, but so wonderful. Father, help us to understand the goodness of your promises kept, the delight of your grace seen, and the way in which it allows us to laugh in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've been looking at Genesis for a number of years. Don't worry, we've got a few more years to go. We're trying to do Genesis over eight years, a chunky year. Abraham's the key figure in the account of God's dealing with a broken world. Uh, Abraham must trust God, take him at his word. Uh, when you look at Abraham's life, there's little else he can do but trust God. Uh, there's a key promise that God's made him amongst that whole raft of promises in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The, the key promise is, Abraham, you'll have a large nation. The problem for Abraham is he doesn't even have a child with his wife, Sarah, whom God says the promise will come to fruition through. Every time we turn up to Abraham, uh, he seems to be jeopardizing that promise, doesn't he? He seems to be taking matters into his own hands because he doesn't think God can do as he promises. Uh, he's lied about his wife. Well, actually, as we heard last week, it was his consistent foreign policy. He's taken matters into his own hands. And every time we turn up Genesis, Abraham seems to be putting another obstacle in front of God, doesn't he? And what, what does God do? He just keeps plodding along, doesn't he, God? Consistently faithful. Uh, at the end of Genesis 17 into Genesis 18, under that oak tree at Mamre, God had sat down and had dinner with Abraham. In the context of that meal and in light of the covenant reassured back there in Genesis 7, and God said, Abraham, I'm coming back in 12 months. You're going to have a boy with Sarah. In fact, I'm going to tell you the name. It's going to be Isaac. And yet even in light of that, hosting God at dinner, hearing that promise face to face, Abraham continues to stumble. Last week in Genesis 20, we kind of went, why does Abraham keep coming back to this lie? Now, he's trusted God ever since Genesis 15, verse 6. I'm at point two on the outline. He's trusted that God would produce somehow the heir that he'd promised, the heir that Abraham and Sarah had not produced on their own. And so God does come back. Look there in verse 1 of chapter 21. The Lord came to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time that God had told him. Really, it's pretty matter of fact, isn't it? Have you thought about that? Oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, God did exactly what he promised. You know, there's no bells and whistles, is there? But there's repetition. Did you notice the repetition in those opening verses? God's doing it, God's time, as God said, just as God promised, as God visited. God's the focus here, He's the key actor. He visits, and miracles happen. People as good as dead produce babies. Abraham's faith is not misplaced or badly found. It just happened as God said. And the storyline that began way back in Genesis 12 is now starting to be resolved because this is the key promise, isn't it? Because without an heir, you're not going to have a nation. And without an heir and a nation, you can't occupy a land. And without any of that, how are you going to be a blessing to the world? God's done just as he said. And Abraham names the boy Isaac. Laughter, as God commanded. 
He circumcises him, the first in the new generation of the new covenant community. And laughter abounds in the camp as a husband and wife who are beyond expectation of a child produce a child called laughter. Look there in verse 6. Sarah said, God has made me laugh. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. She also said, who would have told Abraham and Sarah that they would nurse children, yet I've borne him a son in his old age? There is an obvious joy there, isn't there? Laughter just abounds. There is amazing delight. The laughter is repeated, loud and heartwarming. Who would have told of such a thing? Oh, God would have. In fact, God repeatedly told of such a thing. It's the promise of God, the culmination in Abraham's life of the promise of God. God has proved unfailingly faithful in his grace because Abraham deserved none of it. Remember what Abraham was doing when God met him? All those recommendations we were reminded of last week, a 75-year-old idol-worshipping man with no children. And God had granted him what he could never achieve of himself. God made a promise. God stayed faithful to that promise. God has fulfilled exactly what he said. And, and what did Abraham do? Received it. <laughs> Trusting that God would do as he said. Took God at his word and lived like it. It's all he could do. That's the pattern of the whole Bible, isn't it? Uh, if you start at Genesis and finish at Revelation, it's the pattern by which God always works. God promises... Humans take him at his word and God delivers. God promises. Humans take him at his word and God delivers. And each time God does that, there is amazing delight. Life is good because God has done exactly as he promised. Here's how laughter in life is delivered. Time and time again, God promises, we trust, God delivers. The end result every time is laughter, joy, deep delight that God could grant me what I could never hope to earn or deserve. And that's a pattern right throughout the Bible. There's, a, there's another woman who could not conceive. There's an announcement made, a, a name delivered, a promise fulfilled, a great delight, and Mary bursts into song, doesn't she? The Magnificat, how blessed am I that God would promise I would receive and God would do. In many ways, it's not that complicated, those opening verses, is it? It's really quite simple. Um, it simply needs to be remembered, doesn't it? God promises we receive the promise and God does exactly as he says. But did you notice that there's another type of laughter in this passage? I'm at point three on the outline. There's another type of laughter. Look there in verse eight. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son mocking, laughing, the one Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham. Now, there had been a time when Abraham and Sarah didn't take God at his word. They took matters into their own hands. Remember Genesis 16? God's promise is just taking too long. God needs my help. I'm going to show some initiative here and seize the day. Abraham, would you like to sleep with my slave girl? They slept together and Hagar conceives Ishmael's born. Here is the heir. That's not actually what God had promised. It was by their own works. Not by his mercy. It was by their own meddling, not by grace. And Ishmael remained in the camp. Isaac's managed to reach three years of age. He's weaned. There is a party. I've never been to a weaning party, but I suspect they're okay. Just the fact that he's reached this age is cause enough for a party. There is laughter in the camp, but there's another type of laughter in the camp, isn't there? The scornful laughter. The laughter of the son, the one Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne Abraham. I can understand that kind of laughter. Ishmael had dreams and aspirations, didn't he? And now the miracle boy has dashed them all. 
The promise was to be through Isaac, not the son of Hagar. The promise was to be through the one born of God's grace, not the meddling works of human hands. And Sarah responds to protect her son. There's been a number of years, three to four years, for them to think about this. And I admit she comes across as pretty shrill and harsh, doesn't she? But there's a solid bedrock truth to her words. As God implies, what does grace have with works? What does mercy have with meddling? Those who inherit God's promise and grace are the products of God's mercy, not because of the works they achieve. The son. You notice how Ishmael's name is never used in this section? The son is to be driven out with his mother. And the effects of sin are always hard and painful. Look at verse 11. Now, this was a very difficult thing for Abraham because of his son. Now, Abraham is rightly close to his boy. Abraham has nurtured him. Perhaps Abraham has even still held on to the idea that this boy will be the heir. The bond is close and the parting is emotional. God's intervention is crucial. Again, do you notice God is the key actor here? God speaks there in verse 12. But God said to Abraham, do not be concerned about the boy and your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her, because your offspring will be traced through Isaac. But I'll also make a nation of the slave son because he is your offspring. There's reassurance there. Sarah's right, Abraham. She's understood what verses 1 to 7 are all about. She's had three to four years to ponder this. The promise of God received by faith, produced by grace, will be through Isaac. But there's a promise for the slave son. He'll become a great nation just as God promised way back there in Genesis chapter 16. And it's worth pausing at this point to reflect on this other type of laughter. The action of works taking God's promises into our own hands, thinking we can bring them about because we can do a better job than God, that will never work. We've seen it consistently throughout the account of Abraham, haven't we? We've seen it consistently as the pattern throughout the Bible. The result is the slavery of broken dreams and failed attempts and it will leech delight out of life. Because when I think I am God and God is not, Nothing good comes of that. As we look back at Abraham's life, we're reminded that the promises of God never come by Abraham's meddling, but always by God doing exactly as he promises. And that's the pattern right through to the last descendant of Abraham there in Matthew chapter 1, isn't it? Where the dealing with human sin will come about by God's action. Do you notice that God doesn't remove Ishmael immediately from the camp as soon as he's born? That's actually part of God's judgment on Abraham and Sarah, isn't it? But God still deals in that context. He remains, he intervenes, he acts and he provides. He doesn't turn his back on Abraham, Sarah, Hagar and Ishmael. He doesn't whitewash it. Do you notice that? He doesn't whitewash it so that the family history of this great man of the faith looks even better. He leaves it there. But do you notice how he does intervene? Even as that bitter laughter rings out, God steps in. He's not absent, is he? He's present. And he's not absent as they walk out into the desert. They're sent out. That would have been a horrible moment. They're sent out with with a skin of water. They reach the end of their tether. She despairs. He cries out. Do you notice that God responds to that cry? Did you notice that? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. And God intervenes. God provides. God gives them what they need and reminds them of the promise. And God fulfills that promise. God does exactly as he said, even amidst the bitter laughter that comes as we take matters into our own hands. Now, I I think we know the truth of those two types of laughter, don't we? We know where they are, we've experienced them, 
But we often miss the significance of what they mean as we just deal with the daily drone of life. We miss those sounds, both the good and the hard, as we just plod through. Sometimes you actually just need to pause and to look at an episode in life to see how that laughter plays out, to see what change it can bring. And we immediately get one of those daily episodes in verse 22. Now, we've got to remember that everyday life for Abraham is not really that exciting. He's kicking sheep around. He's looking for pasture. He's got a camp of nearly a 1,000 to look after. He's negotiating with his neighbours. He's providing food and water for his stock. He's looking out for his significant investments. He's spending considerable time upgrading property and plant, digging wells. That sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? in a small rural town. Now, the Abraham who started this chapter was what kind of man? Think back to the end of Genesis 20. He was a weak man, wasn't he? He was a humbled man. He was a man who caved in the face of perceived danger. The vibe here isn't great, so I'm going to make a decision. He's a man who worried and fretted, who plotted out his works because he didn't trust that God would actually do as he said. This is a man who lied to Abimelech about his wife and jeopardised a whole nation and the promise of God. And we've just seen him experience the promise of God as God has done exactly as he said. How's that changed him? How's that changed him? Well, look there in verse 22. At that time, Abimelech with Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God's with you in everything you do. Now, swear to me here by God that you'll not break an agreement with me or with my children and descendants as I've kept faith with you, so you'll keep faith with me and with the country where you are a resident alien. Abimelech's back on the scene. What better way to assess the change brought about in Abraham than to look at the way he deals with Abimelech? Remember last time? I'm scared of you, Abimelech. The vibe's not great. You don't fear God. I'm going to lie. Well, here's Abimelech again. And not just Abimelech. Do you notice who Abimelech brings with him? Hey, Abraham. And there's this fearsome army commander standing next to him. Abimelech's come prepared because his last dealing with Abraham wasn't so terrific, was it, from his side? So he, he rocks up and now's we've got, now we've got the time to have a diagnostic opportunity. Did the experience of grace change Abraham. Now, Bimelech's very clear, isn't he? He knows what's going on. Did you notice that? He knows how to, to read the signs. God's with you, Abraham. I've experienced that. So there's some negotiation here. The negotiation of a neighbour and a land and water and food and someone who's rocked up. Abimelech wants a treaty. He wants some security because last time he dealt with this bloke, he didn't have that written in paper, did he? He wants to make sure that Abraham's not going to diddle him again. If God really is with this man, then it's better to be on his side. What's Abraham going to do? Look at verse 24. Abraham said, I swear it. The same Abraham. Last time, Abraham just brought out a lie. This time, he's straight up and down. Decisive statement of willingness. I can make this decision because I know that God always does as he promises. God's with me. His faithful grace is provided for me. His promises are firm. I can act in life trusting that God will always do as he says. Do you notice that he then speaks openly and honestly? Look at verse 25. But Abraham complained to Abimelech because of the water well that Abimelech's servants had seized. Now he's being open and transparent, this man, truthful. Well, it's a very different man, isn't it, to the last man who dealt with Abimelech, especially when it comes to such a significant resource as water in this neck of the woods. Abimelech acts like we always know he acts because he's a man who's always been straight up and down. He denies any knowledge. He seems genuine. And notice that Abraham then takes the initiative in verse 27. He took sheep and cattle and, hang on, Abraham gave them to Abimelech and the two of them made a covenant. What's this generosity from Abraham? He's not been like this before. The treaty signed. Abraham and Abimelech made a covenant of neighbourly goodwill, animals and the like are exchanged. But do you notice that there are 
some other lambs there. Did you notice that there in, in verse 29? But Abraham had set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock, and Abimelech, who's pretty sharp in these matters, said to Abraham, Hey, Abraham, why have you set those seven ewe lambs aside? Do you notice how Abraham responds there in verse 30? He replied, You are to accept the seven ewe lambs from my hand, so that this act will serve as my witness that I dug this well. Is it the same Abraham who acts with such generosity and grace and kindness? Seven ewe lambs when you're wandering in a desert as a nomad, that is a big investment. That's your breeding stock. And Abraham gives them to Abimelech. He didn't have to. The treaty's already signed. The covenant's already made. The original deal had been settled, but Abraham's obviously changed, isn't he? He can act with generosity because he knows that God is faithful. It's almost like the laughter of his son, Isaac, is bubbling away behind him. And so in these neighborly negotiations, Abraham acts with faithfulness, with transparency, with abundant generosity, just as he had received from God. Abraham's delight in what God has given him is manifested in his daily living. And it is good to see. God's faithfulness has changed him. And Abraham acts with that delightful laughter bubbling away in the background. And then he does what's appropriate. Did you notice that there in verses 33 and 34? Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he worshipped the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham lived as a foreigner in the land of the Philistines for many days. The laughter shows the change, shows the remarkable change in Abraham. It shows that the bedrock of his life is not the meddling of his own hands, but the promise of God. It shows that he has experienced and understood God's great generosity to him, and so it bubbles up into his everyday existence. He's a changed man. Well, we can be run down by life, can't we? Run down in a broken world. I'm at the last point on the outline. Let me share with you one of those obscure, random, and really hard to fact check kind of statistics. A six year olds laugh an average of 300 times a day. Adults laugh maybe 15 to 20 times a day. We get worn down, don't we? The delight of life gets sucked out of us. Abraham's experienced that. But do you notice the change in him? Do you notice the change as he experiences God's faithful grace that has always lurked there and is now fulfilled? And that's the pattern of history. Time and time again, God promises, his promise is steadfast. Humans receive it, trusting him to deliver as he says. And he does time and time again, right through to the greatest descendant of Abraham, Jesus. A promise, hundreds of years of silence, a birth announced a woman who could not give birth, a perfect life, a name, a perfect death, a resurrection. God's promise received, life brought from death. And that will return joy to life. God will do as he promises. And it will happen in the midst of the amazing and in the midst of the brokenness. God will do as he says. My sins are forgiven because God promised and he has delivered. My room is ready because God has promised and he has delivered. My future is assured because God has promised and he has delivered. My needs are met because God has promised and it has been delivered. And so with that foundation, we could actually laugh, can't we? The amazing generosity of God to do exactly as he promised. But more than that, surely we can display that in our day-to-day relationships. The figurative seven ewe lambs, the day-to-day negotiations and the day-to-day thought processes and decision-making, that bubble of laughter called Isaac, 
that God does exactly as he promises with extravagant generosity. And then that bubbles over just as God has done with us. So we do daily. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Really, the theme here is laughter and how it bubbles out. Uh, Father, please help us to grasp again the great delight that comes from you doing exactly as you promised, that through the family of Abraham, you rolled back the brokenness and the curse and you brought your approval in Jesus Christ. Father, please restore to us the laughter of delight at the faithfulness of your mercy. And Father, please enable us to have that delight in our day-to-day living as we relate to those around us so they too can hear that laughter and come to know and love you. In Jesus' name, amen.